Hey, welcome to Overtime, where we take Sunday's message further. My name is Jeremy, and I'm your host. And this is a podcast where we just want to ask the questions that we think that you would ask as it relates to Sunday's message. And as we do so, we hope that it helps you grow in your life and your faith. With that being said, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of the podcasts that are coming out. Not only that, hit the like button, because when you do so, it helps us help other people. And if you ever have a question about Sunday's content or about Overtime, you can submit those to overtime at npaustin.com, and we will be sure to get to those in future podcasts. So with that being said, here's a quick recap of Sunday, and then we're going to jump into our conversation today. We want to talk about the stuff of character over the next couple of weeks. So I want to try to work our way to a definition that we can work with. I want to pull it out of an entire chapter of the Old Testament, Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your secret tent? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts. Those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Those who despise a vile person but honor honors those who fear the Lord and keep their promise even when it hurts. Those who lend money without charging interest and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Character is the resolve to do what is right according to what God says, regardless of the cost. Apparently, when you cultivate this and develop this, you become unshakable. Another benefit is deep, meaningful relationship. Most important benefit of cultivating character is ultimately experiencing God himself. So I want to start off by uh, one saying this is cool. It's our first podcast of 2023. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because we took a little break uh, in between Christmas and New Year's and all that. So. So pretty exciting, and we're starting with the new series, Choose Your Character, mm-hmm. uh, which I was personally very excited about for the reasons <laughs> that you started your message with, and that is that exact same sound. I wish we could have loaded it up, actually, and uh, and played it, but the whole Choose Your Character mm-hmm. from Super Smash Bros. Um, was the heartbeat of our sophomore college apartment. It is good to be with you, Marth. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, what's funny is I had uh, a guy who attends here at North Point text me and say, hey, Marth, mm. and then he proceeded to talk more about... Um, that's the, good. Yeah, yeah. He heard the most important part of the message. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it was very memorable for him. <laughs> so, yeah. So no, it was. Uh, I thought it was awesome. Uh, I, I'm obviously. I was already one in the beginning of your message, yeah. um, talking about Super Smash Bros. And it made me realize it's been far too long. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever enjoyed crowd reactions more than this Sunday. Mm-hmm. Like I know, even when I was like, you know, you were Marth, like there were head nods, like obviously, like <laughs> yeah, of course, like they yep. deeply understood like yep. that duo. I was yep. just like, oh my gosh. Well, this is good. where you and I have this conversation with Buck mm-hmm. lately, which is over the next few years, that will be like more people will relate with us talking about Super Smash Bros uh-huh. than whatever <laughs> version of games he's going to talk about in part three <laughs> and four, uh-huh. Duck Hunt. And, you know, all the things <laughs> right. that he always talks about, which right. we're like, we don't, we don't, not us. Sorry, yeah. but yeah. more people will be nodding their heads too. Of course That's he's funny. Marth. You know, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> no, it's true. Christy was asking me about Super Smash Bros. yesterday. She didn't get it. She, oh, in man. the office, that was pretty funny. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Christy. That's sad. Yeah, it is though. But those are just like, I was trying to. Who was it? Oh, there were some college kids that were talking after service, and they said they still play Smash Bros. And really, and I was trying to explain like the feeling of like walking in the door and somebody's like already on the couch with the game ready, and you like drop your backpack and like know that's where you're going to be for the next few hours. Yep, <laughs> there's just yep. nothing like that in college. <laughs> well, I love that you talked about how we wasted sophomore year, uh-huh. and you forgot to mention how we wasted freshman year of college. Yeah, I was like, did I bring Halo into the? I mean, like, yeah. what the heck? So yeah. I just, you know. But yeah, sophomore and junior year kind of was was all Smash related. Yeah, which is nuts. How long yeah. the game lasted? We yeah. got really good. At yeah, we did get really it. good. <laughs> yeah, to where now, like every now and then, when I end up playing with other people, mm-hmm. I'm like, this is boring. Yeah, it's just it's not as fun. Yeah, I, I wanted to like go into all the nuances, like the fact that we had a guy who was Fox and what a cheat code is. That's yeah. so dumb. But yeah. then like impressive that somebody was Kirby and was still good. Like, yeah, you know. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was Fox and Jigglypuff. Oh yeah, it was Jigglypuff. Jigglypuff. They were always yeah. teamed up together, so right. it kind of so, like, canceled it out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And as someone who doesn't know Super Smash Bros, is like 
Jigglypuff? Right. What the heck is a Jigglypuff? Yeah. And why is Pokemon in J- <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Such a great game. So. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And and I, I will say it does make me feel old when I play the new ones. Like mm. my brother-in-law, he's nine, and he has one of the new new ones on the Switch. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, there's far too many options. There's too much happening here. The graphics are too good. Like they, I would say that the, I don't want to go all the way back to N64, mm-hmm. but the GameCube was the version. Yeah. That was like the best one. I feel like that too. Yeah. But that's what we would say as we get older. So. Yep. <laughs> yep. That is, uh, that is it's what we happening. would say. Yeah. <laughs> Our kids are going to be like, this is so lame. I know. Anyway, so we talked all about character um, in that lane, you know, choosing our character in the same way, you know, or the metaphor was like a video game. Like we choose our character and and really this year what we want to do is not just talk about what we want to see outwardly and the outcomes we want to experience, whether that's faith or financial or relational or health or any of those things. The resolutions are goals we set, but we really want to go inward. Mm -hmm. We want to look at our inner character in the idea that it's going to change us from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And if we work on our character, it's going to impact our faith and our finances and our health and our relationships and all those other things. And so that's what we chose to kind of focus on as we begin this year and in the month of January. But I want to start off with the first question for you. Um, Why do you think character and the way we talk about it in the series is so overlooked in culture today or even looked down upon mm-hmm. in terms of being a person with character or e- like being a prude, you know, would be like one of those kind of cultural words, not exactly the same thing, but why do you think it's looked down upon? Yeah. Well, so I think there's this caveat that uh, I, I don't think it's just an insecurity. I just, to be fair, it's almost like I feel a little inadequate to speak on this. Like I, I as somebody who's more of a, a researcher, a macro like thinker, that's like able to connect some trends. I just have theories. Like yeah. I just have some ideas, you know? Um, I do think, um, like if, if you're listening to this and you live in America, you know, like we live in the most comfortable culture, um, that has ever existed in human history. And that's not, that's not dramatic you know, and that's not insignificant to think about that. And I do think like one of the greatest, um, you know, developers of character is hard times, is difficulty, is struggle. Um, And there are, you know, hundreds of generations before us that just the day-to-day to to survive was a struggle. Yeah. Um, You know, much less even if you think about like our grandparents growing up in America in the 1920s or, you know, so it's like, it's to some degree, we have so many comforts available to us that the character mechanisms developers are like so much less than they've ever been. We have more numbing tools available to us than ever. When we get any kind of uncomfortable emotion, anything we don't want to do, we can uh, suppress that with whatever we choose. There's, you know, so many free options available. It doesn't have to cost you money to numb out anymore. So it's like, okay, there that's significant. And I don't know how much that plays in, but I think to some degree, it's like we have to be so incredibly intentional about the development of our character because the the gravity of our culture and world is to go, um, you know, to go against that. I think social media, to an extent, seems to uh, play into that where the exterior is so celebrated. So, like, what I present, what filter, what seems good on the outside, I don't have to have the inside actually figured out to look good on the exterior. And so mm-hmm. I focus uh, much more time and attention on that. Right. Yeah. Um, we are in a post-Christian culture, which um, as a result means that there is less of a standard an objective standard from which we are to pull from. And that gets really gray and confusing. Mm-hmm. I, I think politics are a fascinating, like, you know, test subject of that right now that um, more than ever, of course, politics have always been divisive, but, but more than ever, it's not a, I disagree with your policy or the result of that policy. It is an attack on character on both sides. Right. And that gets weird. It's like, well, according to what standard, but it's, it's both sides see the other side as completely lacking in morals. Yeah. You know, who you are, you are evil. There's something wrong with you. Um, not just your policy. So right. as a result, but, but that's because we have nowhere, no foundation to pull from. Right. Um, we live in a very individualistic, consumeristic society. Our, our houses have less people in them than ever before. We live further apart from one another in bigger homes. We, you know, the, the American dream is I'm going to be happy, which I think is actually very much the opposite of character development, which is like this kind of selfless, others first, humble approach to life. Yeah, it's um, like a fulfillment versus a happiness. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and as a result of the consumeristic side, we are way more than ever before there, this instant gratification 
instant is the norm. I mean, like, like truly instant, like food delivered now to my door, like that everything is like, bring it to me and bring it to me now. So the idea of like delayed gratification, um, of a greater reward someday, that is so like elusive, uninspiring, not talked about, right? So I don't know. I, I probably missed a couple and I don't know which of those is like, oh, that's half of the fight or that's, 2% of the fight or whatever. Yeah. But I think some conglomeration of those put together uh, means that we're, we're not like, you know, we're not set up well <laughs> to develop great character. There's other social trends where I'm saying I know even less about, but I mean like fatherhood in the United States and so on. So many different things. We have less traditions, less like kind of rite of passage moments, less of like, I'm an adult, I'm a man, I'm a woman now. They, it's yeah. just um, really like, <laughs> you know, not to yeah. be like all bleak and, but we have to be like, okay, think about that because on one hand you might be like, well, we're living in the best times, you know, to an extent, depending on how you see the world. But, yeah. um, but for our character to flourish, I would not say it's the best times. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. Cause I mean, we, 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 our character is refined by hard times. Mm -hmm. We learn it from the people around us in our community. And so when you take a very comfortable and very lonely society, mm -hmm. you will see a lacking of character right. in a lot of ways. 100%. I also, I also think I would add one more thing to it is uh, it makes me think of C.S. Lewis's phrase that he coined, which is chronological snobbery. Mm. And this was like around, you know, World War One, World War Two, when scientific thought led people to go, we are smarter than these like religions and these ideas and like we, we we've gone past these things these are like old ways of thinking these are ancient and what happened when they did that is then they left all the morality and all the teachings behind with them mm -hmm. and so you could you could draw a couple of dots to like what the nazis ended up being is mm -hmm. like we are literally a better mm -hmm. um species mm -hmm. than others around us and it's this chronological snobbery where like over time we become smarter and smarter and smarter mm -hmm. so we look down on people or things that are holding on to past traditions right and so in a lot of ways yeah like you talk about character or you know something something like jesus talked about like sex being for a man and a woman so you should wait till your your wife or mm. your husband mm. like oh that's such an old way of thinking yeah um and in that way i think the the old way of thinking has been like character has been like packaged in with that like yeah. oh it's not a big deal like it's it's an old way yeah. of approaching things yeah 100 you know? percent and I, I do love what I see. I was trying to remember what the statement, the phrase was, and then I saw you wrote it down. But the 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 summary: hard times create strong men. Strong men create. Wait, you should say it because now I'm reading it incorrectly. Uh, yeah. So I and I I was struggling to find where this. I've just seen it circulating on social yeah. media, different yeah. podcasts, different, multiple so different. I don't things. know who gets credit for the original quote. Um, I think it's old, but it's the idea that hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Mm. Good times create weak men and weak men create hard times. Yep. And it's this kind of cycle. Yeah. So we might be transitioning from this like good times to weak men to hard times kind of moment. It yeah. seems like in culture. Now, I don't know how much people always think they're in that, you know, but it, it does feel that that could be this moment today. Like, you know, yep. we're, you know, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, when you think about the the hard times that mm. uh, I saw a post recently, I think Joe Rogan talked about it, but um, the someone born in the night in, in like the year nineteen hundred, mm -hmm. and the things that they experienced. Oh, Did I saw you see the this? same thing. Yeah, and it was like by eleven, it was this, and by eighteen, they yeah, were being, these plagues, these world wars, these like all of this, and yeah, and then know. by forty five, it's like World War Two. This many million people died. Yeah, and then it was by fifty or sixty, like Vietnam War, and it's just like yeah, oh my. Gosh. And then a 15 year old sitting with grandpa is like, grandpa knows nothing. And it's like, oh my, like, it's yeah. crazy. That was like, a wild you know, post. Yeah. 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 I don't know how we can reference that other than just <laughs> go, go look up what someone born in the year 1900 yeah, went through in terms of hard times. Right. It's significantly different mm -hmm. than I think what we experience today. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so funny because we, we were often like, Oh, the world, it's all going to hell in a handbasket. You yeah. know, it's like, but you think about it a century ago, yeah. what it looked like. It was drastically it's worse in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so that's, I mean, that's a lot of reasons why character is overlooked. And that's just helpful to talk through. Um, and then uh, on Sunday, you took a lot of time defining what character is. Because mm -hmm. we can't pursue this thing, this thing that we believe is going to make all the difference in our life. We can't pursue that if we don't know what it is. Right. And so defining what it is was kind of one of the key parts of part one. And you said that character is the resolve to do what is right according to what God says, regardless of the cost. 
the piece of this that I want to hone in on that you did a little bit on Sunday, and maybe we can just kind of unpack this conversation a little further. But why is the, because I think a lot of people would agree with resolve to do what is right, regardless of the cost. Like, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people would go like, yeah, that's, that's a good person. They're, they're yeah. resol- you know, but then according to what God says is that piece that's like, um, people might argue with or have pushback. So why, why is that so important in terms of this definition? Yeah. Well, I think if I were to start more of like the kind of this, uh, you know, uh, this fight between concepts of relative and absolute and the kind of philosophical debates on it, like there is maybe a starting point and then uh, maybe a more Christian response after that. Sure. But like at, at more of just a logical place, we, we would have to admit that um, if, if we believe that, that truth is relative, uh, that good and evil are relative, that right and wrong is relative, the whole conversation around character is really silly. I mean, it, it's, I don't know, maybe a helpful tool to help us live day to day, but it's, it's made up. It's not rooted in, founded in anything. Uh, we get to change it on a whim. We get to judge ourselves differently than other people. Like, um, yeah, a very radical example of this would be like, you define character as someone who doesn't kill people. Mm -hmm. And then I define character as like, it's not a big deal. Right. Yeah. And that's like, well, it's because I can just define whatever I think is right Uh, and wrong the same way you can. Yeah. A hundred percent. And so, I, that's why I, I try to give people permission to say, you know, okay, it's it's the the, the first Sunday of the year. Um, you know, I, I, my hope is that all kinds of people are thinking like, what if I, you know, got engaged in church this year? What if I connected my family? What if? And so, um, you know, if, if that's just, man, there's a lot of big leaps. Like I have fair questions about the scriptures, fair questions about God. Like that's a big pill for me to swallow. It was a lot for me to show up here or tune in today, you know? Well, then hopefully at least we could say that middle part of the definition needs according to what is true. Um, because again, if, if truth isn't real, if it's just made up in relative person to person, then it, it, it just is a pointless conversation. So I think there's a need for truth, some objective standard that we're judging the North star off of, um, which means like that, that gives us the ability to know when, when our heart is already aligned with good character and when we might need to do something difficult because it's like, Oh, I don't want to do that. But what's in the, that, even that space, that space between where I am and what I don't want to do is that there's some kind of standard Mm -hmm. that I know I need to ascend to that I'm not currently at. And that's a painful journey to do that. But it's, it's the standard that gives us the direction, the map to even like go there. What are we even talking about? Right. So I think then the defined by God, now, if you're a follower of Christ, well, now we're like, he, he is the definition of good. Like he, he is the definition of truth. There's nothing more true than the scriptures. Those are the absolute truth that we go to. And so that gives us now the framework that we are to work from. And what I, you know, would love to have gone, you know, an hour and, and talk longer about is like, in like in that the assumptions are God created us. He knows what is best for us. Um, his truth, like out of a position of love, it's his posture towards us is going to be what is ultimately for our good and for the good of those around us. So it's not like um, he's arbitrarily setting rules to kind of like, you know, watch us in some great experiment and have f- so fun. <laughs> like it's like, yeah. you know, he, he has literally given us what is true and what is ultimately going to be best for us. So let's go to that standard um, because that is ultimately going to uh, be the Net, net most good all the way around. And it's true. It's absolute good because we know it is according to what God says. So now we have somewhere to be, uh, to be rooted in. We have this foundation. We have this North star. We know what to compare ourselves to. We know what to hold others accountable to in a loving way. Um, that we can have conversations about, um, as opposed to just going in all, all directions type thing. So, I don't know if that's any more clarifying than what was said Sunday or less clarifying. Cause now it's like, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I think, I think there's, it's, I think it's clarifying and challenging for mm-hmm. two different groups of people. One, the, the Christian listening, who's a follower of Christ and they're saying, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Here's my, here's my guide. Here's my, here's my like way of operating. And, uh, this is what character looks like. And it's given to me through scripture, through who Jesus was, through his ministry, all that stuff. Um, and now that's helpful. Like you said, there's a clear, there's a clear, gap that I see when I am falling short of that. Yep. And that's, that's my like way forward in character is addressing those character deficits. Mm-hmm. And then, so it's clarifying, but challenging in that way. Mm-hmm. Right. And then I think it's clarifying and challenging for the one who's not a follower of Christ as well, because if someone's not a follower of Christ, like where do you get your standard of character from? Mm-hmm. Um, where, where, where do you get your sense of right or wrong? Um, it's, it's, it's wild. that when we start to think about this, it's, it's just, you cannot, 
uh, you get to a point, and C.S. Lewis got to this point. It's why he, bec- I think he became a Christian. Like he talks about this in mere Christianity um, in the fifth decade of his life. He was perplexed that like people would feel like they need to behave good, mm-hmm. but had no way to substantiate like why they needed to be good or what good or bad even meant. And mm-hmm. it was the thing that led him to go like maybe there's an ultimate authority that has ingrained in us an idea of good and bad. And that's that's one way of thinking it. And that could lead you to mm-hmm. um, potentially lead you to the person of Jesus if you continue to follow down that path. But the challenge if someone's really objective and not a follower of Christ is, is yeah, where do you get your sense of right and wrong? Mm-hmm. You know, what what is that? And it, it, if it's based on what you feel, that's a really dangerous place to be yeah. because you can feel one thing and another person can feel nothing, a, a different thing. Mm-hmm. And then we get into this relative relativism conversation of like, well, my truth is this and my truth is that, but yeah. that's just, that creates a really, really chaotic world. Yeah. And so you feel different things at different times of day. You feel different things at different yeah. times of your life. You yeah. Know? And, and we're yeah. hitting on giant philosophical conversations right. in a very brief way. And there's people who are a lot smarter than us to talk through these things. Yeah. But I think if someone's listening and they're like exploring Christianity, yeah. the challenge is where do you get your sense of right and wrong? Yeah. You know, and I yeah. think that's something to like objectively think through and talk about and figure out mm-hmm. on your own. Yeah. And I think without that, I mean, what culture is going to tell you is like, do what makes you happy, you know, which means like huge tenets of character, like loyalty and commitment and all of that are going to be gone because it's like, well, I'm just not happy. I'm not happy in this, you know, work setting. So I'm going to switch jobs when maybe I should have stayed in this marriage. So I'm going to switch. You know, it's like there's so many things that you could be like, well, I, I just need you know, at the end of the day, do what's best for me. And that's some of the weird nuance that's major. Like we might argue, yes, we do want you to do what's best for you, but what's best for you is what God says is best for you, yeah. not what you might think, you know, based on what you happen to eat that day or whatever it might be. Yep. So, And even very simply, you think about like I'm raising Grayson right now and I'm, I'm, you know, he's one, but, you know, very simply teaching him that like hitting his mom is wrong. Mm-hmm. Um eventually I'm going to have to tell him why, Mm -hmm. you know, like that's wrong because your Mm -hmm. mom is valuable and she's loved Mm -hmm. and, you know, you you are to respect her and all those, but I eventually, I just know those questions are going to come. Mm -hmm. Why am I to behave that Mm -hmm. way? Mm -hmm. And I think we, every adult should ask themselves that question. Mm -hmm. Why should I, Mm -hmm. you know, why shouldn't I, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one of the, I want to hone in on one specific part of your message. You talk about gossip and how Mm -hmm. it plays a role in the kind of character we have, (coughs) excuse me. And, This was, I mean, it feels like it's, you know, we're talking about character and all of a sudden we're talking about gossiping, but, um, the Psalm or the, 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 yeah, the Psalm that you talked about, Mm -hmm. um, was the thing that kind of connected the dots. Mm -hmm. Uh, those who refuse or gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends and talking about who's a person of character or not, uh, so basically what I want to ask in all of this is if someone sees themselves in the gossip lane, mm-hmm. and this pops up not just in Psalms, but it pops up in Proverbs and really all over uh, Scripture. I think Jesus talks about it at some point, in the, even in the New Testament. How can they improve their character? If someone's like, man, that is me. I have gossiped. I have done wrong. Um, mm. How can they choose to do something different with that? <laughs> and maybe briefly talk about like why gossip is so significant really quick again. Yeah. Well, I think this is um, what gets a little tricky, and I'm not trying to use this as an out or something. The idea of where we landed, and I think where we'll probably like land in this conversation today too, is this is it's difficult without Jesus being at the center of great character, right? Because as I draw near to him, and as I start to think the way he thinks and see the world the way he sees the world, Um, I can't help but be overwhelmed by the incredible value and worth of every human. The ones I like, the ones I don't like, the ones that seem to have rough edges to me, the ones that I've been hurt by even, like every single one at a, at a minimum bears the image of God, which can be said of nothing else in all of creation. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and Jesus came and died for the whole world, gave up his life for the whole world, So everybody is somebody who is made in the image of God, somebody who is paid for by Jesus, the most valuable price in all of creation, right? And if I am going to slander, you know, talk about, tear down, degrade, dishonor, disrespect, uh, the most valuable (laughs) part of all creation, you know, people made in the image of God, I'm I'm like running into the core um, of the like greatest 
fault of character. <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm the antithesis of character in those moments, right? I'm as far opposite as I could get because it's like the greatest act of character is, is loving people made in the image of God, of um, honoring them, of treating them the way that God has treated me. And so that's why it, it goes so deep uh, because it's, it's at the heart of that. So it's, it's like, to me, really the starting point, which is like, feels like an out or it feels like the church answer. Well, it is cultivating what we talked about in the challenge in the end, which is um, prioritizing my relationship with Christ. Because as I do that, I will see people different. Um, and the conviction will rise up in me, not necessarily because I just specifically focused on gossip, but the conviction will rise up like, ooh, I'm, as I'm doing it, um, like, oh, this is not right. Yeah. And that's been the journey for me a little bit. It's not like when I was a 16 year old, I was like, yeah, I just didn't gossip. Like, no, I did all the time, loved like all the stuff that you do when you're a teenager. And then I came to North Point, became a follower of Christ. And there was a season of me like catching myself, like, and why did I just say that? Why did I just share that? Where did that come from? Like, it, I think it requires a curiosity about where that is coming from to be like, that was totally unnecessary. Why did I feel the urge? Why did I feel, you know, give into that? Like, um, and that, but that wasn't like, man, I was like 2018. I'm not going to, I mean, that's not bad if you're like you, if it's a thing and you're like, I'm going to focus on it, but it wasn't like 2018. It's gossip. It was like, as I grew in my relationship with Christ, that's one of the first things you run into that's totally incompatible. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think it has to be the starting point. I think there are practical things. I think if there is um, a person or a group of people that you find yourself gossiping about, praying for them is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Like it's really hard to pray good things for somebody that you have tension with and then to like say amen and walk into the next room and totally tear them down. Mm -hmm. It's possible we do yeah. it, but it, it makes it a degree more difficult, especially when you do that consistently over time. Yeah. So that may be like very practical. Um, I think journaling about somebody like kind of maybe that's your free <laughs> venting space, if you will. Yeah. Um, you're just being honest with God about like what is in your heart. Um, and I think that's like really practical. I do think um, this is where it's so hard to like give permission. Like, where do you, where do you like kind of go with this? But you know, I think like with a counselor, that's somebody who is like a totally neutral third party um, who like legally can't go stir up strife with what you shared with them. Right. right. And they can help you. They're not like concerned with the other person. They're going to help you understand why you have energy because this ultimately doesn't have to do with the other person. Anyways, when you have energy around someone, it is it is saying something about you right and so however you get introspective about that whether it's through prayer or through journaling or through having a conversation with somebody um, it's going to help unearth that um, and that's where it, it starts to get really broad I mean based on the scenario if it's if it's a person or a group of people that you find yourself doing that about frequently um, an individual that you're consistently talking about about there's probably a forgiveness thing there yeah it's a revealer of something right deeper yeah the surface. Um, if you just find yourself just sharing as soon as you get a rumor like and you find yourself enjoying that well now you're like pointing to an insecurity there's a validation there's like there's something in me um, that is off base in terms of where my identity come from where my affirmation comes from mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, becomes really interesting. So, yeah, I don't know. What, what the, I know there are several things listed in there, but what would you say? Was there something? Yeah, I think, well, for, I mean, for me personally, and I'd be curious to know, you know, what did you discover and what do you think people will discover when they ask themselves, why am I doing that? Mm -hmm. why, what is it? What is in me that's causing that? Mm -hmm. I know for me, when I feel that, um, it's it's most of the time, out of a desire for the other person I'm talking to, to like me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, is like, you know, I'm, I'm going to give them information that they think is cool or they think is interesting or, yeah. or, or I'm just going to fill in the, the conversation with something of value. Right. Um, and it's really, I think beneath the surface, I'd have a really vain attempt to mm -hmm. get the other person to like me. Yeah. You know, I don't right. know. What, what would you say on that one? Yeah. It's like, um, this is funny because this kind of gets into a counseling conversation too. It was like, is each part of us have some good intentions that is like mismanaged or there's just some like 
really an- like not good parts, you know, yeah, and yeah. there's debates on that. Like the good intention part would be like, yeah, I desire to create connection with you. And I go about that the wrong way by like sharing something that feels valuable or intimate, you know, right, and right. thinking that will create connection with you. And I shared the wrong thing. I went about that in the wrong way. Like that might be the good hearted intention. And I think at times, you know, like I would feel that if I'm like, oh, I, I want to, and did you know, or did you hear or something like that? I also think, um, jealousy, I think like insecurity, Mm -hmm. I think those are things that I run into. So, um, you know, if I, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of like, I don't have a good example that comes off the top of my head right now, but maybe, you know, as like a young leader, like thinking about other communicators or, you know, um, you know, I, I, something like that, like tearing somebody down. That's just like, cause I, I want to feel better about me. And I, I realize they're gifted, they're talented, they're doing a better job. They have more influence, they have whatever. So like, I, I, I need to find like, oh yeah, but if you, if you knew them, like blah, 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 here's yeah. what I've heard. Yeah. Um, so I think we do that a lot about people that we experience like a jealousy over or something. We want to make them human, tear them down to feel better about us. Somehow right, we think right. that like elevates. So I think that feels like a very common cause. Um, so I think at the core, we've mentioned things about, you know, insecurity and you know, some fear in that, a fear of them not liking yeah. us. Like at the core of that to me is like, I think of the proverb, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Yeah. It's so simple, but you know, and then we, you talk about Jesus talks about like out of, out of the mouth comes what's in the heart. Mm-hmm. And so you think about these like connections of the heart in a way it's like, when your heart is fractured in insecurity and all these like identity broken pieces, yeah. then from that place comes a, a potentially an outcome of gossip, right? You know, because you, you are trying to bring these pieces that are fractured together. Whereas gossip and talking about that is not going to fix what's going on in your heart. You yeah. know, that's a deeper work right. of bringing those things to Christ and bringing those things to God and seeing yourself the way God sees you. And that's a journey for sure. Mm-hmm. But, um, it's hard, man. Yeah. They're talking about like levels of emotional intelligence and self-awareness that are just like take time to get to. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it still is good to talk about and go like, where, where am I doing that? Mm-hmm. Where do I catch myself sharing information about another person yeah. when they're not in the room? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I, I, I even think about the us. hurt people, hurt people. Like, I mean, yeah. this is the same way you're doing hurt, but I think that's where I, when I started with the Jesus thing, I think that's what I'm trying to like, if you try to just like muster up the strength to like, oh, I'm not going to do it because it's bad. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's lasting. Like, I don't think that like you might a few more times not, you might catch yourself and stop. But I think where the real heart work comes in, where like you really stop becoming a gossip is like your, your security, your identity in Christ. So you don't need to, you don't need to tear somebody down to elevate yourself and the genuine compassion about others. Like, you know, something makes your like makes it to you that shouldn't have made it to you. That's not met with like an excitement. I have some dirt on them. That's met with like compassion, like Mm -hmm. a sadness. Uh, I I usually make the assumption. I don't have all the information. I don't, I can't think of a scenario where I'm like, Oh, I now know something about somebody because somebody told me it about them. I I don't, I just, some of the wildest things I, I, I said on Sunday, I wish I could share some of those, but like, I remember times teams I've worked with getting to the bottom of conversations. You're just like, Holy crap. Like that, nothing like that. Yeah. (laughs) Like happened, you know, just the wildest accusations or whatever. So, um, like for me, yeah, that's where I was saying, if I, if I hear a rumor, it holds like it holds like, oh, I should go have a conversation, you know, if it's something that could, but it, it doesn't immediately like check a box that that's true that, you know, I just, whatever I just heard about somebody, yeah. cause I'm just like, okay. Yep. And I think you and I probably have that filter. You, you more than me, I think in some of the things I know you've worked through and, and gone mm. through just in your role. But I mean, we see people in the church world who get a piece of information mm. and it's like, they got, it's like they got, um, what is the word? It's like they got a redacted report yeah. on a, on a you know, something that happened mm. and there's all these black lines that like, you know, cover everything else up, but all they got was one little piece yeah. and they took that and just kind of blew it up and hurt a lot of people in the process and mm-hmm. unnecessarily damaged relationships. And unne- I think a lot of people's faith yeah, gets totally. challenged because, you know, people take the information and they, and they just don't have all the context. Yeah. And so I, I love the assumption you have is like, I'm just going to assume I don't have all the context, Yeah. you know, when I hear those things mm-hmm. and, and, and to your point that you made on Sunday, we, we, we don't give people the benefit of the doubt when it comes to their character. Mm-hmm. Um, we always assume it's a giant character flaw. We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Um, but if we if we just go like I'm going to assume I don't have all the context and 
I'm going to assume that like, this is not an indicator of their character necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a better posture to be in. Sure. Yeah. Yep. And, and to your point, and this goes on to our last question is, um, yeah, not so much about like, I'm just going to stop doing this, but more about like, I'm going to, I'm going to look at Jesus, look how he treated people and try to treat people that way and allow the outflowing of that to be, mm -hmm. um, that very thing. And you shared a verse at the end and, um, and you said, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, uh, you talked about, uh, sun radiates God's own glory, expresses the exact character of God. Uh, may you put on the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. Like it's all of these things are imitating, looking at Jesus, focusing on Christ, and he creates this character in us. Mm -hmm. um, so th the question I want to end with is just very simple. Like, wh how do we do that? Like, yeah. wh why, and why is that different than just a self-help idea? Yeah. But how do, we, how do we put on the character of Christ? How do we look at the person instead of looking at the list? Yeah. Well, I'll start with something maybe more like theoretical and then, and then maybe super practical at the end. But, um, I just remember for me, um, I am a young leader still, but it, like, especially my first years of working at North Point and stuff, I, I would see a lot of leaders like speak to character and talk about the importance of it and talk about how that will determine your legacy. And, you know, it's character, not competency and all of this. So it wasn't necessarily a new convo, but I always would feel this tension of like, it's something that's set, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just like, I look at people and some people have it and some people don't. And I was always afraid I'm a person that doesn't, you know, I'm like, I just don't, I surely like these leaders don't have the thoughts I have, the temptations I do, like there's something wrong with me. And, and there is something wrong with me, <laughs> like, you know, like that's an okay starting point. Um, but what I, recognized or are part of my learning or part of my journey. And I'm still very much in this aspirational phase. Like I recognize that, like I'm, I'm hoping I can look back four or five decades from now <laughs> and feel like I lived this, uh, you know, a story of character. So I'm like, I still got a long, long way to go. Um, I could be in the newspaper someday, like who knows, but the, the goal for me now is not to go like clean up every er area but just to every single time I like uncover an area of my life that I'm not trusting to Jesus that I haven't invited him into before to discover what it looks like to invite him into that as quickly as I can and just like trust him with the results of that, you know, which feels to me like very freeing. It's just like draw closer to a relationship, draw closer to a friendship, draw closer to it, you know, um, and that doesn't mean that there's not like really hard work involved in that. I'm not saying that, Oh, now it's easy. Um, but it's like the more that I can discover what he says, discover where I'm not trusting him, discover where like a lie is like dictating or drawing or whatever that might be. Right. Like those are the very places where character is cultivated. And, um, I guess, I don't know, cause of ministry or something, a lot of good leaders young. I, I just, I, I think I stopped the self control game in terms of like, just try harder and, you know, translated that more and more to like, what is the false belief that's driving that, you know, like what is the thing in me that like thinks this is okay or good or whatever that is drawn to you, attracted to you, that wants to cut a corner, wants to compromise, that cares so much about what people think, like all of that, like, like don't, don't care what people think. I'm like, that's, I, that's not helpful advice to me. Like, yeah. well, well you, if you do, then what do you do? Like, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. But it's like, okay, the more and more I've replaced and, and, um, shirt up what it is that Jesus thinks about me and how he sees me. Um, it's not like that I'm immune to other people's opinions about me. They just, they're, they're on a lower rung than Jesus is, is, you know what I mean? And I'm not as desperate for the attention or the affection or whatever it might be, you know, as right. a result of that. So, that's what I'm saying. I don't know how practical that feels. I'm just like, at the end of the day, he continues to be, um, the North star. Right. And then I think on, on a practical level, um, I mean, if you're an, if you're an unchurched person, um, I like, I, I feel like my, I want to challenge people to be like, well, what would it take to get to the bottom of the decision of who is Jesus? Like that, mm -hmm. that feels like the challenge for me. If you're really like, I'm just not willing to have God, Jesus Bible be a part of the conversation at all. Then I do think there's probably a, a realization that comfort to a degree is going to be like the enemy of this conversation. So right. what, what might be some of the things that are like, I would have to do different change and all of change is like painful. Right. Yeah. So, um, a degree of intentionality, if I'm not being intentional of discovering what is true of learning about me, um, maybe it is counseling, maybe it's, 
asking what it's like on the other side of me. I mean, there are like practical things you can do to be good some of the hard steps, you know, that, but I, I still, it's hard for me to give that advice when it, if I'm being authentic, my greatest belief is that's all unlocked by Jesus and created by Jesus. Right. So that's that kind of weird dichotomy. Um, the practical side, you know, then I think like a studying the gospels, like that's what gets hard, you know, like I, I think for a lot of people, Jesus feels like the, the Sunday school answer, but I, I'm, you know, it's like, when is the last time, or even if, if just at each new stage of life, like things pop to me just that never had before. I'm asking questions I didn't have before. Um, if you were to really just study the life of Jesus, like how did he respond? What did he say? What did he command? What did he get emotional about? What made him angry? Right. What made him cry? What like, you know, a true, um, I saw it was Dave Adamson, I think is the right name. Is that the digital mm-hmm. guy from mm-hmm. Australia? Uh, he had posted about how, like, for all of last year, he read um, all four Gospels every month. So he was like, I just went through every month and recycled because I wanted more of this big picture view. And so that's inspired a little bit of my time with God for this year. But to that's be like, cool. you know, I just, yeah. it's really neat because you're like, keep coming back to the same, the same things and you pick up on patterns. And um, Andy, in that Louder Than Words book, he emphasizes, and this is practical again, but like scripture memorization. So whatever the temptation you feel, whatever the fear is that you experience, the you know negative thought pattern, cognition that you, you get caught up in, um, to have scripture ready that combats that, you know, and he even talks about like saying it out loud. He talks about, you know, mm-hmm. but there's something that's like, okay, there's a, a false belief in here. Um, and so if I implement what God says, you know, as a result of that, that's a practical way that I'm going to think, because the original question was like, you know, how does Jesus do this? How do we draw near? Like, that's a practical way. I'm going to start to think more like he thinks. I'm going to see the world the way he sees the world. I'm going to draw on something that's true in a moment where something that is untrue has a grip on me. And I, I find that to be like incredibly like empowering, helpful, restorative um, over time, you know, changes yeah. your Quite, quite literally, your brain. Um, yeah, the you know, neuroplasticity. Your heart, your, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. So that could be like a very practical list. But I think that's why all that is different than self-help. Um, I think sometimes self-help gets a bad rep. I'm like, we're a church. We're trying to help people every week. But uh, Jesus tried to help yeah, people you know, exactly. with practical yeah. tools all the time. Yeah, but I think sometimes the way it gets criticized, or at least in church world gets criticized, is self-help seems to be it's me-centered. And how can I go fix me or have enough motivation, right, to kind of hack me? Um, whereas, like, this kind of more Jesus-centered approach is I'm drawing closer to a relationship. Mm-hmm. And being in proximity to that is going to transform me from the inside out. And now the the do, the external, is going to change as a result of the internal change that happened from drawing near to him and, and being really intentional about cultivating that. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, on the list, the list versus the person concept too, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of lines we can draw from the list to the person. Yeah. I even think about how many people just want to get healthy every year Yeah, and how failed mm-hmm. that we are culturally at doing that. Yeah. And I bet if we were to draw lines between like being physically healthy as a person and like to all the way to Jesus yeah, and we would discover like, you know, how much Jesus actually talked about, you know, mentions gluttony and things like that and how more, how much more it's tied into our emotional health and things mm-hmm. we're trying to numb and get rid of, you know, I think we would draw some lines to go, Oh, mm-hmm. now Jesus then produces a different perspective in me to getting healthy. That's like, I'm literally taking care of this body, which Paul says is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, I want you to surrender every part of you to me. And it's like, it's just like a totally different way to approach getting healthy versus like, I just want to feel better about myself being Mm -hmm. insecure when I look in the mirror. Right. You know, Yep. I think, I think we could do that with a lot of our like new year's resolutions is just kind of draw the line between them and the character of Christ and allow that to be the thing that drives us. Yes, absolutely. You know? Yeah. And I, I think it'll be surprising too how, there will be things that you didn't necessarily set out to even work on that, that do transform, you know, yep. like there's a weird balance of like, there are things in my life where I've had to like really focus in on, you know, really try to learn a lot about journal about counseling time. And then others like, I don't know, like apologizing. I think that's an interesting one. I don't know if there was a season where it's was like, I'm going to set out to learn how to apologize. And to whatever degree I can today is very different than 10 years ago. Yeah. And that feels more like the humility that comes from like knowing Christ is like, I don't feel the same kind of protective ownership over. I know I'm flawed, (laughs) like not to the degree I probably should, but I know I'm jacked. And so like, I don't feel like any protectiveness over trying to protect that part of me. That's like, no, I'm perfect at all times. And what I said was not wrong. I'm like, oh yeah, that was definitely wrong. Like, so there, there's stuff like that that is like, 
I experienced that exact thing last year where I was like, okay, this is a big, like I, I try to choose like buckets of things I'm going to work on. I don't uh-huh. quite know what the outcome is going to be, but I'm going to yeah. focus on this aspect of my life or my health or something like that. And I was like, okay, God, here's, here's the piece I'm going to focus on last year. Mm-hmm. And then just this past like couple of weeks, I went, God, you really focused on that thing man, that was painful. And I, that was not the way I thought it was going to go. Right. But the very thing that like he gave to me was the thing he brought later mm. on. It just wasn't at all the way I thought he was going to do it. Yeah. You know? And yeah. so I think that happens a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, cool, man. I think, I think this is awesome. And I, you know, our greatest hope and prayer for everybody listening and watching is just that, you know, you can grow in your character, mm-hmm. but ultimately you can grow in your character by putting on and becoming closer towards the character of Christ. And we're going to continue that discussion throughout parts, you know, the rest of the parts of the series. And we're picking it up this week, talking about what I believe to be one of the greatest costs to having great character and what I think the greatest hindrance is towards us having great character. And so I think it's going to be a great discussion. I'm excited about it. So Jordan, thank you. And uh, we will see everyone for part two, either online or in person or on demand. Thanks, Marth.